Next on BYUSN, the college basketball coaching carousel rolling as the season comes to an end. How recent moves by one assistant and some guy at Kentucky could impact BYU. <laughs> Plus, Olympian Jimmer Fredette joins us for an update on preparing for Paris. Will he have air conditioning there? And playing at the Final Four, finally, this past weekend. Some guy, nice. Women's Volleyball Head Coach Heather Olmstead is in studio to talk about the Big 12 schedule, coaching the U21 national team, and spring practice. Plus, a massive karma manifestation over the weekend for Colin Reuter. For three home run day, it will! Colin Reuter! Remember the name! And welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Monday, April 8th. I am Spencer Linton. He is a mid-major product, Jerem Jordan. You know what? We both came out of the Mountain West, and here we are in the Big 12, uh, Spence. Jimmer Fredette uh, was at the Final Four. What? With USA 3x3. They played, uh, you know, at the open practice. They played at halftime of the UConn-Alabama game, which is pretty cool. Mid-major Madness tweeted, greatest three-point shooter in college basketball history, mid-major product. That's also quite a shot given the Caitlin Clark stuff this weekend. But, hey, we love our, we love our guy. <laughs> Pretty cool to see Jimmer Fredette there. We'll talk to him coming up uh, on the program. Yeah, how does he balance the emotions of being in that scenario this time playing with Team USA in 3x3, knowing that BYU was so close in 2011? We'll dive into that and much more. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. What's Trending presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. We mentioned the coaching carousel in full effect. Round and round we go through college basketball. And the biggest notable stop of the offseason probably happened last night yep. when John Calipari reportedly is finalizing to take the head coach or contract, rather to take the head coaching job at Arkansas, which leaves the Kentucky job open. I mean, wild. You leave Kentucky to go to another SEC school, and it's Arkansas. In conference. Unbelievable. Well, uh, BYU's Mark Pope, you may have heard this, uh, played at Kentucky. I heard that. Won a national yeah. championship yeah. for Rick Pitino at Kentucky. Wow, that's amazing. And not surprisingly, it was included in ESPN uh, reporter Jeff Borzello's list of potential candidates for the Kentucky job. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, in other coaching news, BYU assistant coach Cahill Fennell is taking the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley head coaching job. That is a fact. The Mark Pope thing is all speculatory. Cahill Fennell is indeed leaving BYU. So, Jerem, when you consider a little bit of mm, speculation over here with Mark Pope and what is actually happening with Cahill Fennell, what do these coaching changes mean for the immediate future of BYU basketball? I don't believe that Mark is a top candidate for the Kentucky job. Certainly he's going to be on the list because he played at Kentucky because he played in the NBA, and because he's been a successful college coach. He, he should be on those lists. I don't think he's near the top of those lists. You look at Borzello's list. Like, Dan Hurley might win a second consecutive national title with UConn. He's way up there, right? Billy Donovan is with the Bulls. Jay Wright has retired but won two natties with Villanova. That's a certain level, right? Tommy Lloyd in Arizona, amazing. Nate Oates, Alabama. Um, the, the one thing with this list – you got to win in the NCAA tournament, right? That's the only real blight on Mark Pope's resume at the moment. He's done a lot of great things and will continue to do amazing things. Mark Pope has got to win in the NCAA tournament to be a more viable candidate for a job like this. The moment he does, he is. Like, if BYU had won one game in the NCAA tournament, that's incredible. Like, look what Danny Sprinkle did. Took Utah State to one win in the NCAA tournament. Boom. Washington job. Like, Most from Montana State. To Utah, Utah State. State. Now he's a Washington. In a two-year span. It, it does require – and he probably had that deal locked in even if he didn't win that first-round game. But, like, winning that first-round game really cements your spot in that. BYU had an awesome year. Don't get me wrong. Fit, let's repeat what we already know, but let's just say it out loud. Fifth in the Big 12. Number 12 in net. Ken Palm number 18 right now. Amazing season. But you need to win in the tourney. So, I don't believe that Mark's going to get the Kentucky job. We'd be lying if we'd acted like he didn't want it at some point, given that he played there. It's near the top of uh, the coaching game. It's one of the Blue Bloods. It's a huge opportunity at some point in the future. Yeah. But you got to win in the NCAA tournament. So I don't believe that Mark is a top candidate there. He's certainly a candidate. 
But how about um, one source, a betting source, giving this him is the, the day and age we live in best odds of getting the job? There are odds for everything, including who's most likely to become Kentucky's next head coach. Jay Drew tweeted this out. Fifth best odds to get it. That actually surprises me that he is that high on the list. Um, given, again, NCAA, been to the tourney, would have been in 2020. Let's count that. Three of the first five years. But you got to win in the tourney. What does Kentucky want? They want wins in the tourney. They just lost to Oakland in the first round. So they're, they're not going to hire a guy that didn't win in the, in the tournament, at least recently. So Kentucky- at some point, Mark will be like that guy, Spence, when BYU makes like a Sweet 16 run. But it's not right now. The short list for Kentucky right now, because of who they are and what they want, which yeah. is national championship winning coaches. That is, that is who Kentucky's fan base is looking at right now. Who's won a national championship? Okay, let's start who with Who can take guys. us there right now? Scott Drew has done that, which is why he's, according to these odds, most likely. Like, Scott Drew has been there, done that. Yeah. Jay Wright would be nice. I don't know if he's going to come out of retirement. I don't think so. That feels like a stretch, yeah. but he's won a national championship. And then one, two. Bruce Pearl is interesting because he hasn't won a national championship. He's been to a bunch of Final Fours, but I don't. I think he's an Auburn guy. And so, to me, like Billy Donovan is a guy who was the last to go back to back of any team with Florida. So Billy Donovan takes Florida to back to back in 06, 07. He's with the Chicago Bulls right now. It's like, okay, how much money do we need to pay you to coax you away out of the NBA to come back? with your national championship pedigree and get Kentucky back where you want Kentucky Eight to be. Eight or 10 or 12, yeah. yeah. So, like, it's, it's Scott Drew, it's Jay Wright, it's Billy Donovan right there. And if those guys won't, then maybe you get to, like, the Bruce Pearls and maybe – No, Richard it, Pitino, a.k.a. Okay, the son who maybe, was at maybe Rick Richard Pitino's Pitino, son at New Mexico. He's done an incredible job in New Mexico. But like, because he's a Pitino, there's a little asterisk there. Sure. Yeah. It, it's interesting. But I, I think they should start with guys that have already won national championships. That's who Kentucky is. Yep. That's what they want to be. They want it immediately. Yep. So, and, uh, like Mark Pope above Kelvin Sampson on this list is interesting. Well, I mean, he does have the Kentucky tie. And Kentucky fans would probably feel a little bit of natural innate camaraderie un- with, like, the understanding of, like, oh, it's a Kentucky guy. Like, he, he played. For sure. Know. Just I, I think Mark needs some NCAA tournament wins. I at least a win. Don't disagree. Like, yeah. and then so, he'll be like legit, legit Kentucky guy at some point. Maybe like you make one s- Sweet Sixteen run, you're in the mix. But do Kentucky fans and do the Kentucky Board of Regents, if you know some of these national championship guys say, "Nah, I'm good. I'm staying here." If it got to Mark Pope, like you could understand how they'd be like, "Well, I know that he doesn't have the tournament wins, but look what he did at BYU, like with." A bunch of guys, they were expected to finish 13th. Sure. A, lot of, a lot of good there, no doubt. In the Big 12. I'm just and saying, they finished fifth. Kentucky, Ken, like Kentucky is another level, bro. And, and so they require how many guys, winning in the tournament. How many guys would say no? You know, would it require to say no? Oh, I don't no think. Oh, oh, I don't know. Before you get to a few guys down the list, right? Yeah. I, I don't, how, I don't Kentucky know. Kentucky Sports much, Nation will figure that how out. How much loyalty is there in college basketball? It doesn't feel like there's a ton. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, in the business world. There's not a, a ton of loyalty, right? Uh, and and Mark has uh, you know sought opportunities elsewhere, but stayed at BYU. And that's not, I don't think, less of him for interviewing for other jobs and having things match. For, that's part of the this deal is here. The American no, dream. B, BYU is uh, lucky to have a guy as good as Mark Pope, which is awesome. And uh, I I don't see him bouncing, but rarely do you. We didn't see Calipari bouncing yesterday. See, I didn't today. think it was going to happen Arkansas this fast. I, I, yeah. mean, I, thought, I thought Coach Cal would be at Kentucky for at least one more year. But apparently he was very unhappy, and Kentucky fans are super upset. That well, they're unhappy with it, so it's mutually unhappy. It looks like, yeah. So, like, this was a mutual <laughs> parting, and it's kind of brilliant by uh, Kentucky to do this to just because now they don't owe him anything. Like, it was like $32 million that was remaining. Like the, he, the buy was huge. He, yeah. he would be due if they fired him. And so Arkansas, to come in and swoop him up, now Kentucky doesn't owe a dime to Coach Cal, and they can go get their next guy yep. at Kentucky. So there's a lot more money to deal with, which could be that much more enticing to a guy like Scott Drew or Billy Donovan or maybe Jay Wright. What, what's the yeah. number that's big enough to pull Jay Wright out of retirement? Yeah, 14. I don't, oh, I don't man. Know. That, okay, let's talk about Cahill Fidel. 
This so, is actual, actual thing that's happening. Yeah. So Cahill Fennell, uh, you know, takes head coaching job, which – Congrats. I'm super happy for him. He deserves it. You don't blame any assistants for taking head coaching jobs. You know, he's at uh, Texas Rio Grande Valley. Tremendous assist coach the last two years. Uh, Players really liked him. Good recruiter. uh, Has BYU's defense playing really well. Okay, they were were, uh, 60 in Ken Palm. You say, yeah, 60, I don't know. Tied for third in the last five years under Mark Pope. That's in the Big 12, dog. Like, if that's in the WCC, that version, BYU's top 40, right? Um, I would think. So he did a nice job. Uh, bummer to lose a guy of that quality, but assistant coaches uh, run through every couple of years. That's how it goes. Uh, BYU's been lucky to retain Cody Figure and Nick Robinson for as long as they have. Now they have an opening. They actually have another opening. BYU chose not to fill all the spots last year. They had four. They could have had five. You could have had one who didn't travel mm-hmm. with you. They chose not to. So BYU, if they want, um, they can have two more assistant coach hires. But best of luck to Cahill. Uh, from from what we've heard from players and, and different recruits and whatnot is that uh, and signees eventually, they really like it. He's the reason that a few guys came to BYU. Yeah, so hopefully they're still all in on uh, everything because sometimes you attach to a guy, right, when you're a, um, a signee. But, yeah, Cahill's awesome, and uh, best of luck for him. Man. I'm a little concerned about the vacancy that he leaves. Um, he's not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but embraced the culture, embraced the values, the honor code, and such a good recruiter and helping guys that maybe also aren't members of the church want to come to BYU and be able to handle like the rigors of the academics and the honor code and still play high-level basketball. Like he, he bridges a gap. And Cody Feger does that as well. Like he's in that unique role, but I mean, we're talking about an African American man in this role that helped a bunch of players feel comfortable at BYU. Not to mention he's a great defensive coach, and he was the defensive coordinator for BYU. And the numbers took a massive uptick from the last year in the WCC to where BYU was in year one of the Big Twelve. And so those those are big shoes to fill. No, yep. like, like who's who's the guy? Who's the next guy that can come in and? help fill at least some of that void. Like, I'm, I'm concerned. Like, I, there are recruits that are like, man, Cahill is serious. He's like the reason I want to go to a place like BYU. Like, that guy right there. And so to not have him in the fold anymore, like, that's, uh, that's a loss. And so I'm, I'm a little concerned about, you know, if, if BYU has all the buy-in from all the guys because a dude of his caliber leaves deservedly so for a head coaching job, but – I mean, yeah, it's not as simple as just like, oh, he leaves, then we'll just plug and play, and it's all good. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so, to his credit, he's earned it. I, I'd be a huge uh, UT whatever, Rio Grande Valley fan. Yeah, like yeah. We, we are all fans of Cahill Fennell, and we hope that he does super well. But that, that leaves us somewhat of a significant void on the coaching staff. And you're going to ask more of Nick Robinson and Cody Feger. And, and hopefully BYU can go and find somebody that can be a great recruiter and yep. somebody that can really help BYU in the portal. Because I think Cahill helped BYU in the portal a ton. And he's very soft-spoken. He's very understated about yeah. it. Yeah. But the other coaches will be like, oh, dude, he was huge for us. Yep. So who's that next guy going to be? Yep. Um, so that actual bit of news will impact BYU. It's, <laughs> it's a storyline going into this first part of the offseason, right? Yeah. Football and basketball, like it's kind of over. There are, oh, a number, there are a number of storylines like Jackson Robinson's return, uh, the transfer portal opening up, how many guys can BYU bring back in the core, what do they do about the assistant coach, and then you throw in the football storylines of you know two new assistant coaches and a quarterback battle brewing. So we got some stuff There's some this stuff. offseason. By the way, for uh, sure. Texas Rio Grande Valley, the Vaqueros. Which is oh, like yeah, the cowboy. Cowboys, the, next, the Mexican Cowboys. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. I get us. <laughs> it's another edition of Mailbag Monday. I just talked about a bunch of the things that are going on in the offseason. Jerem addressing them as well. You ask the questions. We answer them on the show. Mason Croxall on Instagram asks, would losing in the NCAA tournament first round be worth it if Jackson Robinson came back for another season? No, be- because I always want to win in the tourney. There's, it's rare to have like uh, that worth it. Because your season's defined by that. I would rather win in the tourney and lose a bunch of guys. And then lose, like, say, Jackson, good luck in the NBA. Like, yes. Like, w- was 2020 was uh, awesome because you lost a bunch of guys. And then in 21, you, you had a great year after that. It's okay to have this banner year and then have, like, a down year. I'm not saying BYU's going to have a down year. Yeah. But it, it's worth it to have an amazing season and then the next year 
it's not as amazing. You lost guys. It's okay. I would have rather won in the tourney personally. We it's all a, it's want an to, interesting yes, question. Like, I don't like the fact that we're still stuck on the, okay, it's been 12 years and running since BYU won a first-round game and got to the round of 32. I don't like that. Yes, I would always, I'm like you. I would always prefer to win, and then if BYU loses some guys, it's okay. It's part of the Those deal. Those guys helped BYU do yeah. something they haven't done in a very long time. In fact, I want to lose guys like that because you had such a good year. I want to lose assistance after you have a good year sure. because it means you had a good year. That's not to say that if Jackson Robinson decides to return because of the loss, it wouldn't soften the blow of the sure, loss. Sure. Like, okay. But there's no guarantee that next year is equal to or better. You have to put in the work. Seize the you moment. You have to have certain things go your way. You just, every season is its own season. Conference yeah. gets to 16 it, teams now. Right. You want to build off different years, but it doesn't always work that way. C-22 football. We thought that that was going to be a continuation of 2021. Yeah. It was not. It was still a good year. Eight and five is not a bad year. Um, but we were hoping for like 10-plus wins. That year. Man, BYU as a six seed, finishing fifth in the Big 12. What would be the equivalent of that next year with a bigger conference? You finish in the top half, yeah. and again, you're a single digit. You finish digit, seventh. And okay, you're, you're a six or seven seed, seed again. And, yeah, but you got to win. There, there is no guarantee. Jackson Robinson returning certainly would help in that regard. We'll see. But it would soften the blow if he comes back of the tournament sure, loss. For sure. Hashtag BYUS on an X, Facebook, and Instagram. Join us in Dallas for a fan fest coming up at the end of April, April 27th, for a one-hour special. It's going to be awesome. Live from Dallas, noon Eastern on BYU TV. Hey, BYU in the heart of Texas a couple of times during hey. the football season. And there is the Olympian, Jimmer Fredette, who joins us next to discuss one making the 3x3 team and then playing with that team at the Final Four this past weekend. Pretty cool deal. This is BYU Sports Nation. This segment of BYU Sports Nation presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Jimmer Mania is back in 2024. We are live in Studio B. This is your day-to-day -day BYU Did Sports play-by-play. -play. Play. I'm Spencer Linton alongside Jaron Jordan. Probably not. Maybe it's it's just still going. Yeah. Well, the center of Jimmer Mania, Jimmer Fredette, joins us now on BYUSN to recap a weekend at the Final Four and give us the latest on his pursuit of 3x3 gold in the Paris Olympics. Jimmer, let's start with Phoenix and the Final Four weekend. You were a prominent part of... Friday, and you got to kind of show off what your team's going to do at uh, the open practice before UConn and Alabama shot around. What was the Final Four weekend like? Uh, it's, it's incredible, right? I had been there one other time uh, in 2011 to receive, you know, our uh, the Player of the Year awards. They do it at the Final Four, and that was in Houston. It was a really cool experience. But at the same time, this was a different – kind of a different vein by being able to be out on the floor and actually play – uh, during halftime of the UConn Alabama game, uh, we played right before the uh, open practices on Friday, and it was just incredible. They did an amazing job in Arizona. Uh, the floor was great. Obviously, the venue was great. We went to the Fan Fest and played a game there, and were able to do some interactions and appearances there. Um, so just to be a part of the whole weekend was amazing. But I mean, they put on a crazy good production. It's it's amazing how much goes into the final four and uh, they've done an incredible job of uh, making sure that everything was going off on time. It went really smoothly. Uh, so credit to USA basketball in the final four for getting that done because the first time we played the exhibition game at halftime of uh, final <laughs> four game. So it's really cool. Is that the biggest crowd you played in front of? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that was 80,000 people, right? Like we had played in that stadium before against Arizona state. I'm sure you guys remember. Yep. Uh, when we uh, played James Harden's team and everything where, you know, I felt like we won the game. Charles they, is the uh, lucky It should have counted. 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 It should have counted. It's, show it right now. I don't, <laughs> if you have the footage, show it right now. I mean, goodness gracious. We, uh, yeah, so uh, we had played in that arena before. It was a different setup because they had brought in uh, stands and they kind of cut off half of that. Whereas in the final four, it's literally the whole football stadium in the middle of the arena. So honestly, 
obviously if you're watching it in the arena, it's kind of hard to see because everything's so far away, but uh, incredible atmosphere. Jimmer Fredette is with us on BYU Sports Nation. We can't help but wonder what your emotions were like as you see the Final Four and think about your own college experience taking BYU to the Sweet 16. So how do you balance the emotions of that of what was so close to happening for BYU when you were playing for the Cougars? Yeah, it's it's bittersweet, right? Every time the tournament comes around, I love watching it because we have such great memories, obviously. Uh, we're able to advance my my junior year and then senior year was able to make it to the Sweet 16 and uh, something BYU hadn't done for a long time. So it was obviously amazing, but we felt like we could have uh, made it to a Final Four and even won a national championship that year. Um, we had a special squad and it was it was a lot of fun. So to be able to lose in overtime always brings back memories in that Sweet 16 round. But to be at the Final Four and feel the energy and and uh, still be able to play basketball on that floor, even if it was during halftime. I mean, it was still 80,000 people in there, and it was still the energy and still the hype, and it still feels uh, very, very similar. So an, an experience that my teammates and I will never, ever forget for sure. Okay, let's, let's just settle this. So if you beat Florida, you would have played Butler, who was an eight seed, who went on a run, right? They, they beat Florida. They beat 11 seed VCU. Are you beating eight seed Butler? <laughs> are you beating 11 seed VCU? Uh, you know, and are you playing for the national title? I think so, of course. I mean, that's, uh, you know, we were confident in our abilities. We felt like we were playing good basketball. Um, you know, obviously didn't have uh, the height that we necessarily wanted at that point. But against Butler, I felt like it wouldn't have been as, as, as much of a deal and some of the other uh, teams that we would have played against. So obviously Butler is a great team. They had, uh, made runs in the tournament before, which Shelvin Mack was on that team, and I know him pretty well, so I'm sure he would have given a different answer. But uh, <laughs> for, for for me, yeah, yeah, we would have made it, and uh, uh, that that would have been a game we wouldn't have lost, right? We were like, we would have been so close, we would have been prepared for that, and uh, rode that energy uh, to to make it to the Final Four, and hopefully, with a national championship, obviously, would have had gone through Kemba and uh, UConn, who had an incredible run at that time too, and they were super hot, so. That would have been a fun game to be able to play in. But, you know, you look back and it's there's nothing you can do about it now. You just reminisce and uh, say what ifs. But um, fortunate enough to at least be able to make it to the Sweet 16 that second second weekend. Well, of note, Jimmer, your team was the last BYU basketball team to even get to the round of 32. And we all thought, okay, this is the year. Mark Pope's squad, they've been so good in the Big 12. They're battle-tested. They're going to get to at least – Saturday and get to at least a second round game, it didn't happen. You played on some good squads that felt like you were going to get to that at least second round, but you lost your freshman year, you lost your sophomore year before you, before you finally broke through, albeit in a double overtime game your junior season. So what did going through those tough experiences, your first two go-arounds in the NCAA tournament, do to help your team kind of break through in later years? Yeah, I'm just glad that we didn't play Texas A&M our third year because who knows, you know, I felt like they had our number for some reason. Um, so, yeah, no, for me, I think there's a lot of stuff that comes with being in the NCAA tournament besides basketball that you don't realize as a player. Uh, the media, the hype, the practices, um, all the stuff. And then once you get on this, the actual floor, it's a way bigger stage than you can even imagine. It's the most pressure you've ever felt as a basketball player player up to that point um so being able to go through that a couple of times first um and then be able to break through our junior and our senior year definitely helped especially for me being able to play in all four of those games have experience and just understand that all the stuff that goes around it and the pressure that you're going to feel right so if you're playing against a team that may have not felt that and you've gone through it a couple times that's going to be an advantage for you because you're able to settle your nerves maybe a little bit quicker than the other team and be able to get into your regular motions and be able to start playing, you know, basketball. But also it just helps with the um, being able to understand the urgency of the situation. You come out, play, um, and know that this is a, a do or die type situation. You don't really feel that until you lose that game and you're like, oh, wow, it really is over. Um, so to be able to have that feeling, to understand, and all the stuff that goes around it, all that experience is going to help moving forward for sure. With that said, with which juggernaut do you have tonight, UConn or Purdue winning the national title? 
Yeah, I was able to watch them both in person, um, you know, at the weekend. They're both really impressive. They're, you know, they're by far the two best teams that have been playing all year. Um, so I'm glad both of them are in the final because this is the best matchup. I think UConn is still going to win. Um, Coach Hurley obviously has those guys playing extremely well. They're very, very confident. Um, they have one guy in Klingon that actually is a decent matchup for Edie. Obviously, no one's a great matchup for Edie, but he's someone that can at least be in his way. Long, athletic, shot blocker. Um, so if he if he's out, that's going to be a, a change in a dynamic. If they can get him in foul trouble, or if Edie can get in foul trouble, one of the two, I think that that's going to be you know something to to watch out for. But UConn's just playing such good basketball. Um, that they they run such good actions. They're patient. They're good defensively and offensively. They've been here before. They've been in this game last year. Um, I just think that they're the the team that's going to come away with it. But I think it's going to be a really good game. So I'm excited to watch it tonight. Jimmer Jackson Robinson is in decision mode now. He has to decide whether he's going to go to the NBA and pursue being drafted. Right now he's a projected mid to late second round pick or if he's going to come back to BYU for one more year. You went through a similar scenario at the end of your junior season. What goes into making a decision like that, and what advice would you offer Jackson? Yeah, I'd tell him to enjoy this experience, go out, um, get as many workouts as he possibly can, get as much in intel as he possibly can, talk to the GMs, talk to the people around the organization, see, try to see what they're really thinking, obviously be close with his agency and see what they're thinking. Um, his family, obviously keep close. Um, and then talk with people that you trust that aren't just yes men that are actually going to tell you, hey, this is really what you're looking at. And this is, you know, the actual opportunities that you have. Uh, once you get all that intel, um, then be able to, to make a decision, right? And that's kind of what I did. I was fortunate enough to be able to work out with, you know, five different teams, one of them being the Celtics um, when Danny was there at that time. So I was able to talk to him and he was really able to tell me kind of what he thought specifically, um, which was very, very helpful to me at the time. Um, so because of that, uh, I tell him to go out there and enjoy the experience and get as much NBA gear as you possibly can. There's nothing better than the <laughs> NBA socks. Um, so make sure you go do that. And then from there, um, make a, make a decision that's best for him and his family at that point. Um, so I'm, I'm confident he's a smart guy. He knows what he's, he's going in there to do. Um, hopefully he goes out and shows well, obviously in these camps. I'm sure he will. He's a great shooter, great player, good at, uh, good athlete, um, and obviously a really great kid. That he'll do well in the interviews and talking with the with the staff and everything. So I'm looking forward to his decision. Selfishly, we want him to come back, yeah. um, but we want uh, obviously the best for whatever he does. Yeah, NBA sucks. I've heard they're super soft. I, I swear I had a pair a couple of years ago that somehow I got, I don't know, from Nike or something. And I was like, yeah, these are next level. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you still have a bunch. Okay, let's finish with this. What's your yep. schedule like the next couple of months leading up to Paris? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just obviously got back from the Final Four. We have this week at home. And then for the rest of the month, we are gone. We go to New York for a media tour. We go to Springfield, Massachusetts for our first uh uh, tournament national tournament that we have here that we're hosting and we go from there straight to Tokyo to Japan to play uh, in a tournament our first world tour event uh, which will be great to continue to ramp up for the Olympics then in May is a lot of training and getting together as a team and in May we go out and go to France and then we go to Mongolia right afterwards and kind of just start the whole whole deal we'll be we'll be gone a lot in June and obviously in July um, we'll be over in Paris in like middle, mid July to kind of start training over in Paris. And uh, so, yeah, we have a lot of stuff coming up from then and uh, super excited for it. But our group is, is pre prepared and ready and we're, you know, getting better and better as we uh, as we go throughout these days. Are you ready for no air conditioning in the Olympic Village? <laughs> well, it's funny because... <laughs> You know, we're under USA basketball umbrella, right? So because of that, we get the same experience as the five on five USA basketball. Oh, look team. at you. Let's guys. go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. So we actually do not stay at the Olympic Village. We they have a hotel for us booked out. Nice. That I've heard <laughs> is very nice. And uh yeah, so we, we will get to experience the village by going in and being able to trade pins and hang out and go to the food and all that stuff. But we do not have to stay in the actual village. 
for uh, our accommodations, which is, uh, I think we'll get the best of both worlds. Thanks, LeBron, <laughs> yes, you will. Steph Curry, <laughs> Kevin Durant. Thank you guys for uh, keeping us under your umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> great. So tender mercies for Jimmer yes. Fredette and 3x3 basketball. Hey, it's great to talk yes. to you, Jimmer. Uh, we're super excited for what's ahead for you. And uh, as always, we appreciate the time, man. Be well. Awesome. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Jimmer Fredette, once again on BYU Sports Nation, playing at the Final Four. It's super cool experience that was awesome okay baseball taking on utah tomorrow on the road you can listen to it of course right here at 80 eastern tomorrow on byu radio up next a mega karma manifestation for byu baseball and colin reuter is it top three greatest manifestations all the time <laughs> this is byu sports nation byu sports nation is presented by the byu store official outfitter of byu fans everywhere Follow this here program, BYU Sports Nation, on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Welcome back to Studio B. I am Spencer. He is Jerem. A busy Monday, and that means a busy Monday's worth of headlines. Men's basketball assistant coach Cahill Fennell was named head coach at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley Friday. Los Vaqueros! Fennell spent the past two seasons as an assistant coach on Mark Pope's staff. Jimmer Fredette, who we just spoke with, and... BYU women's basketball star Lauren Gusson both participated in festivities at the men's and women's Final Fours, respectively, this weekend. Jimmer played with Team USA's 3x3 squad against Puerto Rico in Phoenix. Gustin, not surprisingly, recorded a double-double, 15 points, 15 rebounds in the women's college all-star game in Cleveland on Saturday. Colin Reuter hit three homers to help BYU to a series-clinching 7-5 win on Texas Saturday. He had four homers in the series. He hit a ton of dingers. The Bad Cats took two of three from the Horns. With the wins, BYU, win, uh, BYU now 13 and 15 overall, six and nine in the Big 12. BYU softball's late rally falls short, five to four in eight innings in the finale of their three-game set at UCF on Saturday. The Cougars have yet to win a Big 12 road game this season in softball, and with the loss, they fall to 21 and 16 overall, four and 11 in Big 12 play. 10 wins in Big 12 play out of 27 games should put BYU in the tournament. So they got to get at least six more to feel like they're on the bubble. Upcoming bracketology from Spencer on go. softball. Let's go, go, baby. Number seven, men's volleyball splits road matches at number 13 USC to end the regular season. Friday, it was Brown, Benson, Romanus, double digit kills in the four set win. Saturday, you had 12 aces, most in a match since 2017, but lost in five. Cougars have finished the regular season now, 16 and 8, 7 and 5 in the Federation. BYU men's and women's track and field competing at three different meets over the weekend, highlighted by performances from BYU's throwers at the Triton Invitational in San Diego. Dallin Schertz improving on his BYU number six all time mark in the discus. Danny Bryant put his name at the number eight spot in the shot put, and Leah Katoa took the number 10 spot in the hammer throw. Congratulations to all those athletes. Number 36 women's tennis lost at number eight Texas, 6-1 Saturday. Maddie Smith picked up a singles win for BYU's lone victory there. And the men's team fell at number 24 UCF Saturday, 4-3, nearly had it. Men are still searching for their first Big 12 win. But some golf news, it's Masters week after all. BYU women's golf teeing off this morning ah! at the Texas Showdown in Dallas. And how about this? Former BYU men's golf standout and All-American Peter Quest finishing tied for 10th at the yeah. Valero Texas Open. He made $223,000 for that tied for 10th finish. And keep in mind, he had to make a birdie in a five-man playoff on Monday just to get into the tournament. Then he wins almost a quarter of a million. It's a good gig if you can get it, Spence. What a weekend. Men's rugby beat UCLA 48-15 in the D1A playoff Saturday at Southfield in the first round. Cougars advanced to the final eight, the quarterfinals, at Central Washington Saturday. Daniel Schneeman had a nice weekend in AAA for the Columbus Clippers, going four for 13 overall, including a home run, a double, and four runs driven in. Hopefully he gets that major league call up soon. See your favorite Clipper. He is my favorite Clipper, for sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I like Tony Gwynn as a San Diego Clipper. <laughs> Did he even play in the – got drafted in the NBA. I don't think he played. Ron Harper, maybe. Uh, former BYU and Kansas City Chiefs tight end Matt Bushman announces he is retiring from football. Did get two rings, though. Pretty good. Yeah, that's, pre that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well done, Matt. And he got to go to uh, Taylor Swift's party. So, 
It's, Those it's, are like close to being the same value. It was a good year. <laughs> it's a good year for the Bushmans. <laughs> Those are today's headlines. Now, some opinions in the whip. The Cougar Whip Round presented by Marish, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Colin Reuter hit three homers Saturday after an appearance on the show Friday led to a serious clinching win. Where does this rank on the Karma Manifestation list? Three home runs the day after coming on the show. That's right there with the Skyler Halford goes for 27 points against San Diego and has his career day the day after he comes on our show. Or maybe it was a day he came on our show. Either way, that's right there. That's like a top five it's manifestation. It's pretty good. Jen Hampson nearly had a triple-double one time. She had nine blocks, and it would have been like the first triple-double in BYU basketball history, I think, or something. Croatia going to the that World Cup final is still the number one. <laughs> that was wild. That was wild. <laughs> We picked him at the beginning of the tournament. Randomly. And then World they go to the, to the ship. <laughs> that was unbelievable. South Carolina wins the NCAA Women's Basketball National Championship over Iowa yesterday. The Final Four saw record-breaking numbers. Man. Awesome. Highlighted by UConn, Iowa in the Final Four, garnering 14.2 million viewers. Jerem, was this run by women's basketball one-off with ratings? Or maybe a sneak peek into the future. I do think it's a hint to increase viewership. Certainly the record breaking like 14.2 is a lot of that's because of Caitlin Clark. But the stuff, people love to see stars. Like you go to movies to see certain plots, but mainly certain actors. I think what, uh, and actresses, I think what happened here was Caitlin Clark was such a big star. Paige Beckers is back. Yes. Juju Watkins is back. Um, it's going to be exciting in college women's uh, basketball. Stars games. and villains and big personalities helped this a lot. Angel Reese for LSU played into this as well. Yeah, and for sure. So losing a couple of those players will certainly hurt. Headlined by Caitlin Clark, of course, but I'm, I'm happy for It'll the help sport. Help the WNBA, perhaps. Yeah, I'm happy Seems for the like sport. It. This has been incredible yeah. growth at the NCAA level. Who you got tonight, UConn or Purdue? Purdue is a fun story, especially because they were the one seed that lost to a 16 last year. They're trying to do what Virginia did, where Virginia got upset by a 16 seed, and then the next yeah. year they win the title. Purdue's trying to repeat that. I would lose as a one seed to a 16 if you want to win the national championship. If you win the national championship the next year? It's in your and best interest. Was it worth it? <laughs> yes, ask Virginia. Um, I still got UConn. I just think they have too many weapons. It's going to take something significant from Purdue, and, and UConn has a big man that can actually match up with Zach Eady. Klinger 7-2, and he's so, uh, physical and, and can move a little bit. It's a tough matchup. Like, Purdue's going to have to make a bunch of threes. UConn's the defending national champs. They're plus 125 in this tourney. That's the best through five games since 08 of a team. Give me the Huskies. Yeah, it's going to be a repeat for the first time since Florida did it in 06 and 07, I think. Fred Warner threw out the first pitch at a San Francisco Giants game on Friday. This was nuts. Fred's an all-pro football player. This was He is not rough. an all-pro baseball player. <laughs> I mean, he looks great in that looks Giants good. uniform. Yes, the feels good. Flowing. And then the... And yo! Oh, Fred. <laughs> Fred! Fred is supposed to throw it to his right, <laughs> our left, and then his, he just runs his off. His reaction is outstanding. <laughs> I'm going to give him a pass, one, because he's an all-pro in football. Also, he's a new dad. Maybe he's a little fatigued, a little, Maybe tired. He's a little tired, not sleeping yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. So Fred Fred gets a pass. We didn't give Spencer Johnson said pass after he had a baby. Oh, so We'll boy. give it to Fred. That's right. That's, that's pretty that. funny. <laughs> Up next, we take a look at the BYU women's volleyball Big 12 schedule yeah. for year two and do so with head coach Heather Olmstead. She's also got some Team USA aspirations in the works as well. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. BYU Sports Nation continues live from Studio B. We are in the Cougar Council Room now alongside Jerem Jordan. Let us Spencer counsel Linton. one with another. Let's counsel with yeah. the head coach of BYU Women's Volleyball, Heather Olmstead, who just got her new schedule. And What's up, Heather? Got Hello. some exciting things with the U21 squad yes. USA, so we're going to address all that. But, great. Heather, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Always looking fresh. Got the kicks, Happy got the to jacket. Be here. Yes. You're in the you're in the middle of it. Even though you're not in season, you have like spring ball and yeah. schedule and U21. A lot going it's busy, on. Busy, yeah. Yeah. Recruiting always. Exciting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a few days to digest the Big 12 schedule. So uh, just from kind of a 10,000 foot view, what do you, what do you think of the overall layout of year 2 of Big 12 play? Yeah, it's like another new conference, right? You've got yep. four new teams and it's exciting, I think. The change, you just when you think you kind of know a little bit about what you're doing in the Big 12, it changes with these new, new teams coming in and joining and shake up how we're playing. And so, 
it's kind of anything goes. And so that's how we're talking to our team. It's whatever we get, we're excited about, we're ready to go compete. We know a little bit more about the league, but again, it's changing and I think it'll continue to change until things get settled whenever with all these conference shif shifting. And it's pretty exciting though, just to play new teams and um, play some teams home in a way that we didn't get to play, yeah. but we're, we're ready, we'll, we'll be ready. You're playing every team at least once. You're playing the new uh, kind of Four Corners teams twice. Yep. I would hope that Utah would be protected in the future. Is that Have they told you that, that you'll always play Utah twice? I just don't think, you know, with the way the conference is constantly changing, mm. I think that's to be determined. So I, I think actually there could be more changes the following year. It sounds like we possibly want to shift towards a conference tournament. I think those are things that are oh, being thrown be out there. And so what, what yeah. does that look like? because it's, there's no real equality in who's playing who, how many times. And so I think a way to find a, a true champion, such as other sports as football and basketball, is, hey, let's have a conference tournament at the end of the year. That won't be the case this year. But I do think that a lot of conferences are looking at going towards a conference tournament just to have that end of the year. Let's find a, a champion with, yeah. with how people are playing each other. Would that take out a couple conference games, perhaps? Or would you just start non-conference a little? Or I'm not sure. Sooner? You know, we have 15 teams. If you play everyone once, I'm not sure what that looks like. Uh, if you have some extra matches to play non-conference, I think all that those things are on the table. But this yeah. year, this is what we got. We're excited for, for what we have, who we're playing at home, who we're playing at way. I think it's exciting for the fans. Who's the one that doesn't have a team again? I can't remember. Oklahoma State does not have a women's volleyball. State, yeah. That's right. Yeah. BYU fans have a pretty good idea of what Utah volleyball is because yeah. you've maintained that rivalry through the years, but yeah. there's not as much information about Colorado, Arizona, and Arizona State. Um, if you look hard enough, you can find it. But what, if you could summarize. Arizona State from last year. Sure. Sure. If you could summarize what those teams will bring to the conference, uh, what, what do you know about the Buffaloes and the Sun Devils and the Wildcats? Yeah, a lot of respect for the Pac 12 and what they've done. Uh, the history of volleyball in the Pac 12 is, is very deep. And so they, they bring in a lot of experience, great coaching staffs, great players. Um, you know, we know we see them out recruiting a ton. We know some of their players, and I think it's exciting for our players to be able to play some some closer institutions. And in the state of Utah, like you said, I think growing the sport and seeing what women's sports is, the excitement that is being built around multiple different sports, I think that's exciting for us to be able to have games in the state against teams in our conference, uh, and then to go close places where we recruit a lot and then get out outside of the, the West to, to play some of those other teams is really exciting for us. And there's pro leagues popping up. Salt yeah. Lake's getting one. Yeah. Obviously, you have Whitney Bauer and Kamila Hiapo, and Heather Knighting's going to play for the Salt Lake team, which is super exciting. Yeah. About this schedule, you are on the road Thanksgiving week again. Yeah. What, one time you'll get some home matches here, but yeah. you, last year it was, what, at West Virginia, yeah. TCU, and now it's uh, at Kansas, at Kansas State, the Wednesday, uh, Friday of Thanksgiving. Yeah, week. just opportunities for us to be together and go on the <laughs> road, and uh, it's exciting, and it's what we got. So we'll, we'll spend Thanksgiving together with hopefully some, some Cougar fans in, in Kansas, and we'll get them to come out to our games. And... I think, yeah, at some point, hopefully that turns our favor and we're home, but uh, it's exciting just to know where we're going to be, what weeks, and, and start planning for that. Who, who's like the, hey, you got to plan Thanksgiving dinner uh, person on the staff? Yeah, our Haley does a great Haley, job. She's our Haley director dominates of Watts, it. Yeah, yeah, and make sure we're taken care of. And, and, <laughs> and usually we have some people in the area that, that come out and support and help us find somewhere to go. And I think, yeah. you know, Kansas and Kansas State will be great hosts that week for us, so we're excited. Let's just get you whatever you need in that meal, okay, yes. Heather? Like if what is it a, that you need a in that specific meal? side dish, okay? Yeah, I love so turkey. straight turkey, turkey person. Turkey, stuffing, yeah. and some pumpkin pie. Okay. Let's go. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some pumpkin pie, we're good. The classic. Go and beat Kansas and Kansas Gravy, State. let's go. Uh, all right, Heather, let's go ahead and kind of take another big picture look here at year one in the Big 12 yeah. and where you feel like having gone through that has now prepared you and your staff and your team for year two. Yeah, I think just the experience we got in the travel and the arenas that we were in, they were jam-packed, they were, they were rocking. Uh, we've got to feel that. We know what to expect now when we go in these arenas. They're, they're not quiet, they're not empty. Mm. And again, the sport, volleyball is growing, it's exciting, it's on TV, people want to watch women's sports. And so I think we're ready for that uh, better and our fans understand what they're going to get when they come to the Smithfield House and watch teams come play and they, they supported us the whole year. So again, a new look with new teams and so I think that's just exciting to just – to say, hey, we've got this year too, but it's also exciting, it's new, we've got new teams, and, and just keep the momentum going from there. You guys took a picture after every Big 12 win. Why was that important to you um, in year one? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, just the, the, the way BYU volleyball has been a, a winning tradition, I think, you know, it's not just about the winning, but it's about the history of being in the Big 12 and being year one, and that group and how special they were 
to be the first group in the Big 12. We just wanted to, to remember those moments and have the players and, and the staff and the school remember those opportunities we had to, to play the first year in the Big 12. And when you get a win, anytime you get a win, it's just a big deal because winning's hard. And so we didn't want to take those for granted at all. What kind of opportunity is there with Texas out of the league now? Yeah. Um, obviously, you and Kansas were two and three there. A lot of good teams. Doesn't mean you automatically just go to the top, but um, it feels like, hey, there's an opportunity to win yeah. a regular season title. Yeah, I think you just don't – it's the unknowns with the new teams. Um, it's the unknowns with just a new conference. And so everyone was chasing Texas, and they were a great, fantastic team and won the national championship. So for us, that was different than the conference, you know, we had been in where we had been been, been – blessed to win conference championships, we were now hunting that and trying to, to, to understand the expectations yeah. and the standards and the level that you needed to play at to win in the Big 12. And now Texas is gone. So what does that look like? I think the standards are still the same. They're very high. The expectations mm -hmm. are high. And we know what it takes to win at the highest level, no matter what team you're playing across the country. Yeah. So I think it's exciting to think there could be some movement, um, but I think we're still chasing that excellence in the Big 12 and what that looks like and how we need to be consistent every day. Correct me if I'm wrong, you're in the middle of spring practices right now. and Last week, okay. we're at the end. You're yep. at the end, last, last week. week, okay. So coming to the end of this, what do you feel like is the strength of your team at this juncture? And maybe what's the biggest question mark you have about your squad moving forward? Yeah, I think just the, the opportunity that we had to play in the Big 12 and know where we need to be and be able to kind of mold those practices this year. It's always about serve and pass. It's always about offense, right? You want to be offense hitting for a high clip transition, first ball side out. And so that's how you're going to make your money is where's our offense? And so where can we score more in the middle? What pin can score more back row? I think that's a big deal any year you're going and uh, as, a, as a new team and so I think that's things we focused on this this spring was where how can we produce more offense uh, serve and pass game needs to get better and 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 I think those are areas we definitely improved in you're the U21 national team coach which is super exciting you're yep. going to train in Anaheim compete in Toronto yep I like seeing Jalen Reyes on the staff which is fun um, what are you most excited about with that opportunity yeah very honored and blessed to be a part of USA and to be included in the umbrella of USA volleyball and the opportunity to learn to be in Anaheim with uh, right before the Olympics. I'm not sure if the team will be in their training. Some some arms of the teams of USA will be in the gym, but to be with a, a group of women and staff that are just excellent performers and want to be high performing people, I get to learn from them. And so I'm excited about taking you know what we can do from BYU with USA and what USA can give back to BYU. I think it's it's really exciting for me professionally, and um, we'll see how, how we fair in Canada. You, at this juncture of your career, um, you've already accomplished so much, Heather. So where are you trying to get better as a head coach? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I think just trying to be consistent every day, try to show up for your team. We're chasing that national championship as a program. I think the journey is, is a big deal as far as getting our team to buy in that mm. um, you just never know. You can't control the outcome. There's a lot of good teams out there, a lot of good players, but let's, let's be invested in this journey as far as how good can we be? How good can this group be? And it's not so much about winning championships, Big 12 championships or national championship as it is how good can we be? Mm. And me personally, how can I learn and grow and have that growth mindset and know that there's going to be ups and downs, highs and lows, but if we're consistent, um, it, you know, we're going to have success, and that's what we're trying to teach our players. Great stuff. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Heather. All right, up next on BYU Sports Station, maybe one more of your elite mailbag questions, and let's just go ahead and give the rise and shout-out to a bunch of peeps, shall we? There's too many to just give it to one. This Sorry. This is BYUSN. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back with our elite mailbag question of the day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated. It comes from Caleb McKay on Instagram who asks, was BYU baseball's series win over Texas the best thing to happen in BYU sports since Kansas? Speaking of the men's basketball win. Could have been. I'd also throw in softball beating number four Oklahoma State up that there. That was pretty well. Two grand slams in that game. And then the grand slam winner against Houston uh, to win 17-15 in a walk-off fashion was pretty good yeah. as well. There have been some fun ones. They're models. all good. Yeah. Today's Rise and Shoutouts presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics, and there are a plural. Cahill Fennell, new gig for him. Go Vaqueros. Matt Bushman retiring. Colin Ruder, three homers, four in the series. Lauren Gustin, double-double in the All-Star game. Peter Quest. Oh, by the way, Jim Fredette. Peter Quest won $223,000. He wasn't in the tournament when the week began. That's amazing. What well, a week. Well done. 
Our thanks to today's guests, Jimmer Fredette and Heather Olmstead. Just some USA homies, right? Yes. Sorry to Dennis Pitta. We ran out of time. You didn't represent me. <laughs> <laughs> it's always something he didn't do. <laughs> for Jeremy Spencer, shout out to Camry Godfrey Willardson. We'll see you tomorrow for BYU Sports Station. Go Cougs! USA!